Welcome to BIV Today. We are the daily business news show from Business in Vancouver and BIV.com. I'm reporter Tyler Orton. And as of now, look, we're not even two weeks away from the start of the school year, and it's a prospect laden with some uncertainty and some monumental transformations. Post-secondary will not be the same. And with us to talk about the future of education right now, it's incoming SFU president, Joy Johnson. Joy, I want to thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Tyler. It's a, I'm really pleased to be with Business in Vancouver. Thank you. So correct me if I'm wrong, but your official first day on the job will be September 5th, uh, 1st, I should say. And, and prior to that, you have been serving as president of research and international over at SFU. And I, I'm just curious, how has this transition process been over the last eight months after it was announced that you were going to take the reins over at SFU? Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting time, that's for sure. When I applied for the position uh, of president, um, I had no idea that we'd be facing a global pandemic when I took up the role. Uh, so it's been um, as, you know, has been challenging, that's for sure. Uh, it's, you know, it's been really interesting to be watching the university um, and pivot to online learning and to doing our work very, very differently. It's been really um, beneficial to be part of that transition and to have been an internal candidate selected for the role because I know what I'm up against. I know the assets that we have at SFU and feel really confident in the team. Uh, it's, um, people are pretty tired though and I'm really cognizant of the fact that moving into the fall we continue to have a number of challenges. I'd also say that our current president, um, Andrew Petter, has been very generous in terms of sharing his wisdom, knowledge, et cetera. So I feel really well prepared from that standpoint as well. At this point, look, uh, we have the start of the school year coming up, but tell me about some of the top priorities that you have, ensuring that things can go as smoothly as possible as we transition into just th this unprecedented sort of time right now. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, first priority is the safety of our faculty, staff and students. And that has to be top of mind in every decision that we make. Um, I think another priority, obviously, is uh, a very um, strong learning environment for our students. Uh, you know, it's this is challenging. Most of our learning in the fall will be delivered online. And um, many of our faculty have not done online teaching before. And so you know, getting up to speed, um, providing them with the tools they need and the support they need is really important. And then we also have a priority, obviously, around keeping our research going. We've got lots of research happening focused on COVID-19, but also in other areas as well. And so making sure that we have um, our labs um, running and are safe to do this work and that our faculty and researchers are appropriately supported. So those are three of many. And then I would just say, finally, just taking care of people. Um, people are tired and it's been a long summer. We've been doing online teaching over the summer. Um, people have been working from home and certainly recognize that um, that has a number of challenges involved in it as well. You know, you look at what's going on in K through 12, there are going to be plans for bringing young students into those classrooms there uh, in cohorts and the like. You had mentioned that remote learning, online learning is going to take up a big chunk of this. How do you imagine, is there even going to be such thing as kind of a t typical classroom experience? Uh, how do you imagine this going moving forward? Yeah, so um, in the fall, most of our teaching will be online. And that will be either synchronous or asynchronous. So what synchronous means that all the students are online listening to a professor together. And that's really, I think, kind of similar to the way one might expect our teaching and learning to go. Um, asynchronous is where students do modules and things on their own time. And as you can imagine, not all of our students have been able to come back to Vancouver and might be in different time zones. So asynchronous learning has its benefits, particularly for our students who are living in different time zones. So I expect there won't be a new normal. There will be a combination of different kinds of teaching methodologies, techniques, seminars, chats, etc. cetera. Um, and we are doing some on-campus um, teaching, um, mostly for very small courses um, that can accommodate um, uh, physical distancing. 
um, and some um, labs that really, there are certain subjects that are really hard to teach online, uh, chemistry, for example, as you can imagine. So there'll be some smaller um, labs as well offered. Well, it is going to be interesting because you think about the dynamic that exists in the classroom, in kind of the, the auditorium, you have the lecturer at the front, they can call on students, ask questions. Uh, there's some that maybe uh, shy away from uh, speaking up. Uh, how is that dynamic going to be changing if everybody's on kind of Zoom calls similar to what you and I are doing right now? Yeah, it's a great question. We recently did um, a survey of our students about their online experience over the summer. And um, there's some great learnings coming from that about how we can make sure that um, all students are involved, included. I will say that um, the results from that survey were fairly positive. Students did feel they were getting a quality education, good input. Um, but as you mentioned, there will always be certain types of students that will struggle. And we need to be um, thinking about how to better support them, um, how to teach them. Uh, you know, some of these particularly first year students coming right out of um, high school, moving into university, but also online learning, we know we're gonna have to support them in a bigger way. So we are offering um, cohorts of students for them to like, you know, through groups get to know each other so they can support one another. And um, these, these hives of students, um, hopefully, um, at least they'll be able to meet some friends um, and, and connect because that's also part of university life is to have to make friends and to connect with people. So I, I'm going to date myself just a little bit here, but I, I recall when I started my undergrad experience um, way too many years ago, um, there may be like two or three people with notebook computers in the classroom. And, you know, by the end of my fourth year, I'd say about uh, half to three quarters of every classroom were relying on technology. And I, I'm just curious about how the reliance of technology, if we're going to see kind of a similar acceleration and adoption, or are young people already kind of in tune with what they already need for these new learning experiences? It's a great question. Um, what we have found is that our students, some of our students did not have the technology or, for example, the Wi-Fi capacity um, in their living environments um, to do their online learning. We um, quickly created a fund um, to help supply uh, equipment to our students. Uh, we've been looking for, you know, um, computers that aren't being used that we can share and um, trying to, you know, problem solve on the ground um, to make sure that our students um, are um, able to participate. We've been investing in more online platforms, platforms like Zoom, others to make sure that we have um, the technology uh, on our end as well to, to offer this kind of education. So I guess the answer is that some students are very savvy, have all the equipment, but not all. And so um, from an equity standpoint, again, we need to make sure that students do have the tools that they need to participate fully in their education. Well, I, one of the things that I, I wonder about is the uncertainty of it all. Like if only we had a crystal ball and we could know exactly when, you know, a new normal could resume, we don't know that. Do you anticipate that that is causing maybe some anxiety about kind of the post-secondary experience, at least for, I don't know, the, the next semester or two? Absolutely. It's causing anxiety for me. I mean, <laughs> obviously, uh, you know, just think about it. Last March, none of us thought we'd be still in this situation where we'd be, you know, basically physically distancing and experiencing people on the street wearing masks. But here we are. And so now the question is, how much longer is it going to go on for? Everyone is referring to this as the new normal. So that creates, I think, quite a bit of anxiety. I think many of us hope we'll be back to face-to-face -to -face teaching in the classrooms and wonderful athletic events and cultural events within the university, meetings, face-to-face, -face, vigorous debate and dialogue. But um, right now, um, we can't see when we're going to be back to that. And so we have to adapt. And um, we have to take care of one another. That's why that's also a priority because as you said, people are stressed and anxious because uncertainty really, uh, I think, creates that for all of us. Well, if we're looking to the future as well, uh, you guys recently are, you're moving ahead with the Burnaby 2065 campus master plan. Uh, tell me about some of the substantial changes, the sort of stuff that you think is, is just gonna jump out to people as they look at this campus in the coming decades. Well, one of the things I, I, uh, I, I absolutely have to mention, um, because it hasn't been built yet, it, it's still a desire that we will build it, is the gondola. 
Um, so right? this, is a, this is a people mover to move people up onto Burnaby Mountain from Production Way. Um, so the SkyTrain station um, um, stops at Production Way and uh, it would be a game changer for SFU. Um, we run in, we, we move a lot of people by bus up onto the mountain every day and, um, uh, and in the winter time, often those buses can't run. So this is green infrastructure. It makes a lot of sense, a lot of economic sense. And so, um, you know, five years time, you know, my, my desire is that people will come to SFU and see that gondola and um, be able to experience um, SFU make, and it will make it much more accessible. Beyond that, there's already so much happening on campus. We, I just had a tour of the new student union building and this is a building the students themselves raised money for. It's fabulous and it will make a huge difference into the life, lives of our students. You know, it's a little bit sad that right now it won't be populated and animated with students, but um, I encourage, you know, once it's open for people to come and take a look at this amazing building. We also have a new stadium that's been built. So things are happening at SFU in terms of building on Burnaby Mountain, but we have a lot more um, plans in place and it inc includes uh, indigenizing our campus, having way si wayfinding um, and, and recognition of the indigenous heritage and land on which the campus is built, providing better walkways and wayfinding for, for people. Uh, it's sometimes a confusing campus to find your way around. So all of those things, I think, will make the campus much more vibrant and, um, and, and, and people friendly. Uh, you mentioned the stadium. Uh, I'm thinking about kind of sports. It's a question I'm sure you've been dealing with. But tell me about the dialogue that's been going on with regards to the, the name change that you guys are going to be moving forward with. Uh, the, the SFU clan, which, uh, of course, we know the history of that word and there's different connotations. And I'm sure it's not the intention uh, when it was originally selected. But uh, tell me about that dialogue that's been going on recently. Yeah, so I, um, I've i certainly been watching the dialogue. Um, President Petter made the decision and announced the decision to move away from naming our sports team the, the SFU clan. Um, you know, in the end, this was a decision that was made ba uh, based on a lot of input. And it was really the students, athletes themselves that said it was time for a change. Um, I appreciate the fact that clan with a C has a very, very different meaning. Um, and, you know, it's very much a part of the Scottish heritage, um, is used in a very specific way. But when you hear it in the Southern United States, um, many people did not make the dis distinction between clan with a C and clan with a K. And our students were ridiculed. They were experienced a great deal of difficulty. And they asked us to change the name. And so we listened. And I think, um, you know, uh, the clan name served us well for many, many years, um, but it's, it is time for a change. And so we're going to be um, involved in a process to come up with a, a new name for our teams, uh, a name that our student athletes will be proud of. And um, I think it was the right decision, and I certainly stand behind it. Well, uh, why don't we leave it off with this. Um, looking forward to the uh, next uh, month or so, uh, what are you most optimistic about? What, what do you think might be one of the biggest challenges ahead? Well, I'm most optimistic about the capacity um, um, of our faculty, staff, and students. Um, they are amazing. Um, they are dedicated. Uh, they are enthusiastic. And I see them making a world of difference every day. Um, what am I most, what's the biggest challenge? Uh, I, I really do believe it's the stress and strain that everybody is under. I mean, I'm on Zoom meetings with young women who are trying to mind their children and teach them and also do their jobs. And I'm sure you're aware of that. It's a challenge for all of us. Um, I'm, I'm very mindful of the strain as we talked about um, in terms of the emotional strain that people are experiencing, the uncertainty, et cetera. So we've got to be mindful of that. We need to take care of our community um, as we move forward. Um, I will also say, and maybe particular to the business in Vancouver community, um, one thing that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about though as well is the role the university will play in recovery. Um, I do believe that we, you know, we're an important economic driver in our community and we have an important role to play and we're giving a lot of thought to that about how actually, you know, we're talking about bring it, bringing, bringing it back better. How can we play a role in that? And that's exciting as well and something I'm really looking forward to.
Well, I, I know it's going to be kind of a very dynamic time. A lot of stuff still in flux. I, I'd love to pick your brain in a couple months as, as we uh, mosey on through this first or second semester. But um, for now, Joy, I, I just want to thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Thank you, Tyler. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. All the best. That is incoming SFU President Joy Johnson, and that is it for the show today. But we will be back next week. In the meantime, go to BIV.com for more interviews and more stories there. For now, I am Tyler Orton.